All right, so uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Rachel Walling. I'm a preservation planner with the City of Columbia. And I wanna thank you all for joining us uh, for this Preservation Month event. One of the first events as we kick off the month of May. Um, so each May is National Historic Preservation Month. Um, and every year preservation staff organizes uh, a number of events to celebrate history, architecture, and of course, historic preservation. Um, so this year's Preservation Month activities, we are focusing on stewardship. Um, so looking at uh, the protection and responsibility for our built environment so that future generations um, can enjoy them as well. So that's really what our historic districts are all about. And um, the folks we have joined with us tonight have plenty of experience uh, with that. We'll get talking about that in a moment. Um, so tonight's event is based on Jane's Walk, which is an international organization of uh, volunteers that lead walking tours each year around uh, the first week of May. And the idea is to um, get people together to observe and share stories about their community and get people talking. Um, this was started, I think, around 2006 after um, Jane Jacobs passed away. A group of her friends got together, decided to um, organize Jane's Walk um, in her honor. So if you're not familiar with Jane Jacobs, um, she was a writer and an activist who was active in New York City in the 1960s primarily. Um, she went head to head with city planners at the time who were um, really doing planning from a top down and very car centric um, uh, approach to urban planning then. So she was very active in stopping freeways from being built through New York uh, City and um, which would have destroyed neighborhoods like Greenwich Village, uh, which is where she was living at the time. So she got really involved in that um, and really turned planning on its head because um, she uh, believed in the idea that the people who live in a community should have a say in how it develops. Um, so, which is really how city planning functions more today. It's more of a community-based approach um, than taking a, a top-down look at it. Um, Jane believed that it was really important for people to get to know the places where they live. And because of that, that's why they do the Jane's Walk because one of the best ways to get to know a place is to walk around it. You know, you see it so much more when you're walking on the street than you do driving in the car. Unfortunately, since we are still not doing in-person events, um, we are going to skip the walk, but I do encourage everyone to get out and walk in neighborhoods and, and around the city as much as possible. Um, but we are going to have the talk, the Jane's talk instead. Um, so, we're going to be talking about our city and neighborhoods with the help of a few residents and leaders from our historic districts. Um, we have other planning staff on the call this evening. Lee DeForth is our comprehensive planner. She's recording the Zoom for us. Um, and Megan McNish, who is also a preservation planner, is monitoring the chat box. So throughout the call, if you have a question you want to ask um, the group, please feel free to type that in the chat box and we will come back to that at the end. So without uh, further ado, I want to introduce our speakers, our panelists, uh, our community leaders who have um, so graciously uh, agreed to join us tonight to get this conversation started. Um, we have Rusty Sox from Cottontown. Hey, Rusty. And then we have um, Joe Weeder and Bob Guild from Grandy Mill Village. And then Josh Shelton from Historic Melrose. So I wanna thank you all for joining us. I'm really excited to get started to start this conversation. Um, and just to, to kick us off and get us um, acquainted with one another, I'm just gonna ask each of you to tell us a little bit about yourselves and how you came to live in Columbia how long you've lived here, just a little bit of background about who each of you are. And uh, whoever wants to kick us off, feel free. Bob, I see you first, you wanna go? <laughs> sure. Okay. Well, um, so I think I'm probably long, the longest uh, 
uh, service in this uh, group in my neighborhood. Uh, this is my 50th year living in this house and in the Granby Mill Village. Um, I'm a, a military kid, uh, we grew up all kinds of places around the country and never had a rootedness before I chose to live in Columbia. And so this is a, my home of choice, uh, both physically uh, in Granby neighborhood and in the city of Columbia. Um, I'm an environmental lawyer and I, I started law school in this house and have been here ever since. Um, um, and, and, you know, I chose this neighborhood really by happenstance. It was simply the cheapest place I could find to live at the time. And, you know, uh, I, I spent uh, most of my law school years living in half of a mill house with a couple of roommates. We spent $60 a month uh, splitting for uh, a duplex, uh, a half of a mill house. And, you know, it just was really cheap housing is bottom line. And I absolutely came to love the, um, the people in my neighborhood who were a mix of Bohemian characters, uh, um, retired and active mill workers, poor people, uh, students. And, um, uh, and I love the architecture and the, the feel of the neighborhoods. So we can talk more about that, but you know, this is the place I chose to stay and I'm here today. Great. Joe, do you want to jump in since you're in Granby too? Oh, Joe, you're muted. There we go. I came here in January of 76 from New York City, an artist filmmaker who uh, came here to teach at the University of South Carolina and did for about 10 years and then uh, left the university to pursue my own career as a documentarian mostly and uh, loved it here. Uh, my first, the first draw, how I found uh, what was then called Olympia. They called it all Olympia. It was a, it was a, a wino who was throwing Richard Peach bottles in my bushes who informed me that this was not Olympia, this was Granby, the Granby Hill. And so, I mean, it was a discovery, but it was a fascinating place, very inexpensive, lots of space, cheap, and uh, which is always draws artists and interesting types and, uh, and loved it here. I couldn't imagine living in any other neighborhood uh, in the city. Even to this day, it's still, uh, it's, it's suburban, but it's, it's, it defies suburbia. So I love it for that reason. And, it, and the homes are beautiful. Rusty? Hi. <clears throat> um, I grew up in Columbia um, in, in the Irmo area. I was born in Columbia um, and uh, went to Irmo schools and the University of South Carolina and then moved away for a while right after college uh, for, for a job, but then ended up coming back and uh, and when I came back, that's when I decided to to buy my first house, and um, and that's how I ended up in in Cotton Town, where I've lived for the last almost twenty nine years. Um, I was attracted to um, sort of you know, early 20th century bungalows and cottages. That's really what I wanted and had targeted maybe uh, Shandon or Rosewood or that area. But at that time, those houses were beyond my means. And um, so uh, discovered Cotton Town purely by accident, uh, but there were homes for sale and the vibe was very similar, but it was much more affordable here north of Elmwood Avenue. And, um, and that's how I ended up in the house that I'm in and that I've been here ever since. I do love this neighborhood. Um, I, I, I uh, just adore the people here and, and the, the vibe that we all create together as neighbors and friends. And uh, just, although I never imagined that I would probably spend the rest of my life in this first house that I ever bought, um, that's the way it looks like it's going to unfold, and I'm perfectly happy with that. 
All right, well, I'm Josh Shelton. Um, I'm the most recent transplant to the city out of this group, it sounds like. I, I finally moved here in 2015. I had been in and out of the city since 2012. I was in the military, um, in the Army, in the Army Finance Corps, which is headquartered at Fort Jackson. And so I came here for initial training, uh, came back here for subsequent trainings a few years later, and then got an option for an assignment here in 2015, and we took it. Um, and was able to stay here long term, and then I made the decision to transition out and um, staying here long term. Um, so when we first moved to Columbia, I was living closer to the to the base, and then in 2016, when I knew I was going to stay here longer term, we started looking for a house. Uh, did not know the city at all, um, just browsing around on Zillow and. Uh, the house we ended up settling on, I think I hated it online and loved another house in the neighborhood. And we came in for this, this other house, open house, and I decided it was too small. And we went one street over to the other open house. And once I saw in person, the windows were the first thing that stood out to me. And um, me and my wife both knew right away that it was, it was our first house. And we knew uh, we had found our place. And um, so we've been here ever since um, and just recently undertook an, another move inside the neighborhood. I'm, I'm a wild man. We decided we needed more space after the pandemic, spending a year on top of each other. Uh, and we knew we needed a bigger place, but the requirement was to stay within uh, Melrose, uh, which was a tall order because there's not always a lot of big houses that go up for sale in the neighborhood. Um, but we were able to make it work out and just last week moved into um, uh, a new house here in Melrose. So been here since 2016 and love everything about our neighborhood. Um, did not know at the time the group of people I was going to get to know here in Melrose, but have fallen in love with these people. Um, they feel like family. Um, I actually mentioned to neighbors when, it, when it, we felt like it was time to move if I had to move away from Melrose, I was ready to move away from Columbia altogether because we were that passionate and Melrose was my sense of community and, and our family here. So um, we just have fallen head over heels for the neighborhood and love grows every day. That's great. I mean, all of you have, have touched on what, what Josh was just saying about, you know, he moved and he, he wanted to stay in his, his neighborhood. So, I mean, did, did any of you want to expand on, you know, what keeps you living in the neighborhood? I know for Rusty, Bob, and, and Joe, you know, it was the, the price tag at first that got you there. Um, but what is it that, that keeps you staying there? And like, why, why haven't you moved or why don't you want to? Well, let me just uh, say that, you know, I um, didn't appreciate what unique character the Granby Mill Village had until I was, uh, you know, here for a while and enjoyed the neighbors and thought the diversity and cu rich culture of the, of the population living here was, uh, you know, uh, the most attractive thing. And then I began to, you know, get involved in neighborhood activities and, and city planning work. And I began to appreciate that Cotton Mill Villages really represent the cutting edge of sort of new urbanist design. Uh, ironically, these turn of the 20th century uh, communities were built uh, without uh, reference to automobiles. Uh, you know, cotton mill workers didn't have cars. And so it's inherently a walkable community that ironically designed by the mill company itself had this integrated community that was walkable to, to uh, schools and churches and sports facilities, stores, and of course your place of work, which was the cotton mill. And that walkable character and that intimacy of the neighborhood where you walk down the street and the front porches are all open and literally I'm used to in certain days past before lots of air conditioning, uh, you know, people sitting on their front porch uh, interacting with, um, you know, with passersby. So to me, uh, that character um, uh, was just uh, ironically something that people now build into new designs for communities. And uh, I realized it really needed to be preserved. And of course, uh, mill communities were not thought of as highly as the grand houses that got most of the uh, historic preservationist attention. And so it, it required, you know, a little bit of, of advocacy and education, as well as uh, a reinforcement from uh, historic preservationists that this neighborhood was worth saving. And, and I think uh, 
you know, that's been the start of Joe and my and many of our neighbors' uh, 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 efforts at trying to do what I think we've managed to do, and that's uh, preserve the architectural integrity of this really special place. Chair, did you want to add? Yeah, um, the neighborhood for me was fascinating because it was my first uh, exposure to Southern culture. <laughs> so it was really fascinating. But I also, in as a child, was raised in, you know, my family was working class. You know, my parents were, uh, I'm a first generation American. My parents were both born in Europe. And uh, so all of my aunts and uncles, they all worked for a living in various, uh, you know, laboring jobs, I mean, wage earners and stuff like that. So it was very easy for me to feel comfortable here, even though I was the first college educated, you know, graduate degree uh, a member of my family. Uh, it was nice being here. Everyone was very friendly. And it was very easy for me to relate to the folks, even though there was an obvious accent barrier. <laughs> I sounded like I was. I remember I was at a local. Uh, uh, I, I walked over to the Rosewood Market. Uh, you're in New York, I didn't have a car or anything when I first came here. I just said, "Oh, what a mile here, mile there, no big, you know, we'll just stuff it." I walked over to a, a little convenience store in Rosewood Drive to get a, some beer, and they had Rheingold there. And I was going, "Oh man, they got Rheingold," and I was showing it, and they looked at me like. That's crazy. Plus, I had a weird accent. It was fun. But uh, what was neat was uh, I really got to know a lot of the folks who were uh, either retired or actively uh, working in the mills. And because of my ethnographic background, uh, it was very easy for me to gain their trust, even though I was, you know, the Yankee. Uh, and it was fun. I, I loved it. I mean, we became dear friends. I mean, I helped a lot of them through some very difficult patches in their lives, you know, and helped them. And when they had to sell their homes and move on, I helped them sell their homes. And so it's it's been it's been a very uh, as Bob said. Yes, there there are a lot of issues. You know, we had to transcend the preservation by neglect uh, reign that we had inherited. And, uh, and and move beyond that. And I think we've done that. So it's been, it's, it's been engaging. It really has. It's, uh, and, you know, in Columbia, you really need, for me, I need that kind of engagement. I need to be involved in my neighborhood. And, uh, and this certainly requires that. <laughs> Our neighborhood really does require that there are two or three or four really caring people. Otherwise, I, I don't know what would have happened to this neighborhood. You know, I think the city and the, the university early on had visions of this just being mowed down so they could turn it into intramural athletic fields. And, and it was horrible. I mean, here's the, this was the economic engine for this city. I mean, this was the beginning of the industrial age for this community. But if you look at, at all the postcards you'll find from that era, just feature Olympia Mills and the Mill Villages as being the brightest spot economically in the history of the, the, of the, well, the state for that matter. I think it was at the turn of the century, more than one third of all white people in the state of South Carolina work in textile mills. I mean, it was it. Was it. So it, it's, it's fascinating to me. And it doesn't have, for, for people like Bob and myself who aren't from South Carolina, it doesn't have that stigma attached to it, you know, being a limp head and having to, you know, raise up to the, through, to the middle class from the mill villages. You know, most people are more than willing to abandon it because of the stigma of the mill village. But, you know, I mean, it's, it's just an insecurity uh, issue, I think, for most folks. So, yeah, we love it here. We truly do. We've got some issues that we're, we deal with every Every, every stage of our development has, has pluses and minuses, but I'm sure with all of you, it's it's the same. Yeah, Josh, Rusty, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I'll I'll add. Uh, well, what Bob said is absolutely true. Um, I don't think I ever understood it or appreciated it until I lived in this neighborhood about 
how an architect, the architecture of a home and the, and the, the way a, a neighborhood is laid out changes the people in the neighborhood and it does make you interact and it, it, it does cultivate a community um, because people are walking in the neighborhood. People are sitting on their front porch and there's more organic conversations and relationships built because of that. And I think that the sense of family that I get in this neighborhood, I would never have gotten that without um, the way these homes were built and the way this neighborhood was laid out and the way it was preserved um, because it does build, it, it lays the foundation for a community. And uh, I think that is what keeps me staying here is because it just got, everything creates that sense of belonging that I desire. And I, like Joe said, um, I'm not from here. I don't have family here. So I do desire that pretty heavily. And so I get that from this neighborhood. Great. And, and I would agree with those comments from um, Robert and Josh and Joe as well. Um, the you know, it's, it's really about the people and the relationships um, that you develop with, with those that, that live nearby, but the, the design of the neighborhood and the architecture of the, the buildings really support that um, and, and, and keep it going. And, and I think that's really, you know, a great reason to, to stay part of the neighborhood. And I think in Cottontown, We've, um, we've come together as a neighborhood around um, challenges at critical times in our neighborhood's history. And, and many times those issues have been about um, uh, threats to the neighborhood's health or design or um, uh, preservation in one way or another. Um, uh, the, one of the earliest examples, I think, are when a, um, a connector was proposed that would connect um, to uh, Interstate 277 over to uh, 126. This has been back in the, I think, maybe in the in the the 80s, um, and that connector uh, was proposed to cut across the north end of of the neighborhood and it would have uh, if not destroyed that end of the neighborhood it would have certainly um, undermined it in some really significant ways and it was a, a serious threat to the the well-being of of this community and that was really the beginning of um, I believe the, the neighbors coming together around an issue and really um, uh, making a strong case for uh, maintaining the neighborhood, and that project was eventually shelved. Um, the, although I will say that there are many days when I wish there was a connector from 277 over to 126, but just not over Cotton Town or, or over anybody's house for that matter. But, um, but and there have been other examples uh, since then where you know the neighborhood has really come together to fight for its well-being. And those are the types of things where uh, times where you you get to know who it is you you live with and and um, and and for for good or ill you get to know your neighbors and and you you move forward together as a community. Yeah, I mean, so so Rusty, it sounds like um, preservation was you know kind of reactionary. Uh, in the neighborhood because you saw a threat um, and you were able to, to rally around that um, and try to get some protections in place and y'all did eventually. Um, y'all, all the, all the neighborhoods we're talking about today are historic districts um, and I know Bob and Joe were involved in the early creation of their historic district. Um, Josh, you're a little bit newer, but I know, I know y'all recently um, became a, a national registered district. So, I mean, do you feel like the preservation of your neighborhoods was more reactionary to something negative coming? Um, and then over the time, has that evolved? Well, um, you know, I, I think that, that the, um, the, the historic preservation I saw always as a tool of promoting um, healthy neighborhood, not just from the perspective of the architectural preservation, which is really important, but in, in terms of um, 
of building a sense that these were affordable uh, homes for families, for people to live in. You know, I came as a student renter and never thought of much of a sense of stewardship about my house um, until I spent time and, and became a homeowner. And I think Joe and I've always had a vision of trying to see these modest houses as being uh, ideal, uh, affordable um, family homes. And, and uh, so it was a positive vision that, you know, it was associated with preservation. But of course, you know, um, as Rusty says, those challenges really are what motivates you, the threats are, you know, when the mills closed, uh, they were active cotton mills, as Joe mentioned, when we first moved into the neighborhood. And uh, when the mills closed because, you know, cotton textiles moved offshore, uh, the development community told us the mill buildings were too big, too grand an enterprise to, to preserve and adaptively reuse. The university acquired them for a time and they were going to tear down the Olympian Grandy Mills and put the Strom Thurmond Wellness Center there. And you know, they were sort of offered to the neighborhoods, well, we'll leave the towers behind as a memorial to the cotton mill. And, you know, the neighborhood leadership and the, and the folks in the communities generally uh, dug their heels in and said, no, we have high expectations for uh, these beautiful structures to be adaptively reused. And, you know, fast forward, uh, the mills have been turned into, um, you know, magnificent loft apartments. Uh, the 701 Community Center of the Mills, likewise, uh, a real cent community center for the entire city. And um, that, I think, took, uh, I think, determination on the part of the neighbors to resist, you know, poor alternative choices that would have sacrificed uh, the neighborhood. And just one last thing I was going to say is Rusty mentioned uh, you know, highway threats as being a motivating force. You know, when I first saw commercial maps of Columbia in the mid 70s, they showed um, a, that north, that same north-south freeway that I think Rusty's referring to that would come off of uh, 77 or 277, swinging along the riverfront and literally obliterating our neighborhood with a new bridge at Whaley Street, which would go right through the neighborhood. And it didn't even show the mill village on the map Mill Village had simply been excised from, from the commercial um, map. And so, you know, recognizing that, you know, the city did not value uh, or develop, developed an interest in value the mill neighborhood, uh, I think that was a, another strong motivating force for us to get uh, national register status. And then with a lot of help from the city preservation staff, thank you very much, guys, um, getting a very specific design uh, protection standards written for uh, the mill villages that finally, uh, you know, um, recognize a mill, a mill house uh, zoning classification with lot sizes and setbacks and square footages that reflect the historic character of the neighborhood. And, you know, we feel secure now. Uh, we're, we've been recognized as a, you know, a, a, a valuable, acceptable housing type in the neighborhood that's uh, deserving of uh, architectural conservation. Yeah, the uh, the interesting thing about the uh, the neighborhood early on was that the homes were so affordable, like the people just didn't feel like they were worth anything. I remember there was this one house on South Williams Street that the city had been harassing, rightly so, because it was you know uh, a blight issue. And, uh, and these people just went, well, we'll show you. We'll just go ahead and tear it down. <laughs> this is before we had any recognition of any sort, I think. And, and they didn't realize that, they didn't realize that the houses were worth more than, you know, they just thought they were worth maybe three or $4,000. I mean, interestingly. So we, we were able to get about a dozen people in early on to buy homes and to renovate them. So we kind of had like neighborhood uh, block captains, people that bought in and, uh, and renovated, but it's, it's a lot of work. You know, it's a lot of work and a lot of money in a red line neighborhood. It was a challenge because it's a red line neighborhood that, you know, that was questionable by, by anyone's standards. And uh, so it was a difficult job. So the people that moved here loved it. When they, when they came into the neighborhood and realized it was an old textile mill village from out of state, of course, they loved it. And they, I had a, we had a waiting list 
of people wanting to buy homes to renovate them. And they did and did beautiful jobs. So it's, it's been, it's been fun. It really is. It's been and rewarding. And uh, now we've got another, uh, the people that developed the mills. Uh, we, you forgot to mention, they also wanted to put the Greek village in front of the Strom Thurman Fitness Center <laughs> in our neighborhood. We went, no, God, no. <laughs> what a nightmare that would have been. The poor mills would have been gone forever. I think they were going to tear Granby down entirely and turn it into intramural fields. It's just a horror. This is the university. And then, uh, but uh, we now have PMC, the people that develop the mills. Uh, they are buying up a lot of the uh, houses and turn them into single family residences. And, and they're buying them for top dollar and then investing another 200,000 in renovating the interiors. Uh, but the, the important thing is they're turning them into single family residences, but as student housing, rental housing, but uh, we're hoping that when the student bubble bursts, uh, that we'll have flippable single family residences uh, available to anyone that's interested in moving in this community. Turnkey. Rusty, Josh, did you want to, did you want to add anything on that or? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, in a lot of ways our, uh, protections were a little reactionary, but I, th I think the more recent National Register was more um, ex preparing for the future. Um, I mean, there is a little, there's always gonna be a little bit of reactionary to it because you always will have someone, whether it's a university, a city, or any type of developer who just it will never live in that neighborhood, has no vested interest in the long term. Uh, success of that neighborhood and they're just there to extract rent or extract uh, money from it and so you, you are trying to discourage that you want the neighbors to dictate the future and so I think a part of that definitely plays into it um, but yeah I think Bob mentioned something earlier was being a steward and that I think that's more of where it comes from me is it's about preserving this neighborhood for future generations. I, you know, I want them to be able to appreciate the brick, not not have the brick painted, but appreciate the brick for the brick's sake. Um, and so I want everyone that comes after me to love this neighborhood for the same reasons that I loved it. Um, these things are timeless, so. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So, I mean, Joe and Bob and, and even Rusty, y'all talked a little bit about um, kind of being part of that original push for preservation. Was there anything um, that made you know you had to be a leader, that you had to step up? Were you recognizing that need? And, and Josh, I know you came into it when there was something a little bit more established in your neighborhood, but what is it that, that got you interested in really stepping up and for your neighborhoods? Well, I used to, um, I used to go to the city's, um, what used to be the, the Landmarks Commission that was the predecessor to the Design Development Review Commission. And, um, you know, they spent a lot of their time talking about the lace house and, you know, the big houses, the grand houses. And I think it's just at the point where uh, Elmwood Park was being, was the first um, listed design protection neighborhood uh, that was not individual grand houses. And the, the chairman of the Landmarks Commission was a uh, uh, former professor, Professor Emeritus John Bryan, who was an uh, applied history um, uh, and author and very well thought of um, um, uh, authority on historic preservation. And he took me aside one time and said, Bob, you know, you live in one of the most intact cotton mill villages um, left um, in the country. And, um, you know, the cutting edge of historic preservation is communities like yours, not just the grand, but the big house. And, you know, you need to realize that, you know, professionals in this field are are recognizing um, the, the, the worth of preserving neighborhoods like yours. And I must say, it took somebody like that to kind of light a fire under me and make me appreciate, you know, that uh, I didn't have to make uh, excuses for why, my, why I love my neighborhood and why it was worth, uh, worth preserving. And, uh, you know, we found that it, it really just took um, uh, a handful of folks. I mean, you, you, you name this, event after Jane Jacobs, but the reality is uh, there are just, you know, 
millions of Jane Jacobs and, and Jacob Janes out there uh, who essentially take an interest in their community and, you know, uh, sort of uh, inherit the mantle of leadership, whether they like it or not, because somebody has to do it. And um, I think that's been our experience. Uh, uh, you know, people people's talents come to the fore when, you know, there's work to be done. And Joe's the, in our neighborhood, Joe's the jack of all trades for knowing how to restore these houses. He's done it with his own hands. Uh, and so he knows what kind of paint to put on them and how to replace the sills and the windows and, you know, uh, how to do a good in inspection to see what other house uh, is more of a challenge or less to, to repair. And and that that talent's mirrored by lots of experience we've had with others who have similar or, or different takes on how to contribute to their community. So um, I'm, I'm sure that's a similar experience to in, in, in Cottontown and, and Melrose as well. Uh, uh, you know, people come forward and share their talents, right? Well, uh, for me, um, at the time that, um, let's see, in the, in the mid 90s, when Cottontown decided to try to go for the National Register District designation, I was working at the South Carolina Department of Archives and History. So I was familiar with that process and the, um, the, the research and the materials that needed to be put together in order to be successful. And I had access to some people that could help us get it done uh, that way too. So it just sort of made sense to join that effort on, along with many other people who, who jumped in and helped uh, uh, Patty Marinelli um, in Cottontown, uh, Jeff Sotong at the time, uh, and, and, and other people too contributed to that effort. But um, I just happened to be in a unique position at that time to, to, to get involved and, and help as I could. Um, and it just made sense to stay connected to the preservation track with the neighborhood as we moved from there. It, it, it took 12 years to progress to getting the, the city's um, uh, architectural conservation district designation, but um, we all sort of just hung in there together and, and, and push that through as well. Yeah, one, one, one thing that motivated me more than anything else is that even though uh, when I first moved here, there are uh, the people that were the older residents, uh, their homes were in pretty good shape, but a lot of the rental properties were in horrible shape. I mean, if you think our neighborhood looks a little rough now, it was, it was wild and woolly. And, uh, and it didn't matter to me that the rest of the neighborhood looked like it was going to fall, collapse on it, on itself, felt like a house of cards, but it, it's pride of place. No, no matter where you live. I mean, that was for me, I just started, I just made sure that the place I lived was clean, painted. I didn't care if I was renting or not uh, when I first got here. I mean, I just, I, I had a garden, you know, and flowers in the yard. And I mean, just, you know, it was, this is where you choose to live. You know, this is where you're, even if it's temporary, uh, so, you know, that's carried on. And then when I finally bought a place, uh, I, you know, I just said, this is it. You know, I'm, I'm invested here and, uh, you know, and I want to make the neighborhood better as best I can. Same with Bob. Bob's got a beautiful home. Uh, you know, and, and, and that's part of just having some pride and self-respect more than anything else. And so even if your neighborhood is a, in a little on the rough side, uh, I loved it here. I'm a minimalist. When I was, when I stopped making art, minimal art was my interest. So I love repetition. I, I looked at the slot box houses that remind me of the photographs of Dan Graham. Really, I was so excited. I said, I can't believe it. It's so wonderful. All homes are the same. And uh, it appealed to me, sorry. And, uh, but yeah, so it, 
I just loved it here. It was so close to the university, right on the river. I was like, God, wow. Yeah. I loved it. And she trifecta. I mean, yeah. what, else, what else could you want? <laughs> Josh? Uh, yeah, so mine is more recent. Um, I think for me, it's always been a sense of duty. Um, and I think, Joe, you mentioned something, pride in place is definitely important. Like we are invested here. I mean, generally speaking, your home is your largest investment in your life. And so take care of what you've got. I've always had this attitude of make things better, um, leave them behind better than I found them has always been my attitude. And, um, you know, it's, and it also is like, if it's not me, who else is going to do it? So step up, you know, it's your duty to step up and lead and, uh, part of that's maybe the military side of me. That's what was ingrained in me as a military officer. You, you always step up and you lead. Um, but it, it's just it's just a pride of place. I think Joe spot on saying pride of place and um, just being passionate and, and trying to do right by your neighbors and your community. Well, I think uh, all, some of you have touched on this a little bit already. And, and Joe and Bob, you know, you've been in your neighborhoods for a long time. You've seen people come in and, and go out, you know, a lot of the original residents have probably moved on by now um, for you guys. Um, do you have any strategies when people are coming to the neighborhood um, for getting them acquainted with preservation or do you have any efforts like that? Or do you find it's, it's difficult with people coming in over time to kind of bring them on board with the, um, the goals of the neighborhood? Yeah, my experience with that is usually uh, particularly earlier on, uh, is I'm usually there the very first day they decide to start the renovation efforts. And this one house in particular, it's right behind Bob's, was so bad with a chimney uh, leak that the center sills had washed away from the chimney, which was uh, working as a pier for the center sills. So their floors downstairs were all, <laughs> all going inwards towards the hearth. And, uh, and they were there like, what do we do? <laughs> and there you go. But that was it for me. I, you know, get, get, go to Bluestein's, get a crawl suit, and uh, we'll start tomorrow morning at, uh, at, at 8 a.m. And it'll take us all day. And get, go get a bunch of cinder block. So we could get jack everything up and get it propped up until he could get a proper brick mason in there to do the. Uh, but I mean, that's that's what it's been like for me is just helping everyone get started because you know no matter how good you are. When I bought this place, I had no carpentry skills in terms of I'd never used a hammer. I was more of a cabinet maker. I was building giant stretchers and boxes, and they they had to collapse like a cabinet and fit into boxes to be shipped uh, for artists. So, I mean, I, I rarely used a hammer ever. So I, it was like, I couldn't even drive a nail straight. I mean, really, that's how, that's how. <laughs> but you got to help people get, I mean, with on the renovation side, you got to help them get going. Yeah. yeah, I imagine not everyone is as hands-on as, as Joe. <laughs> Any other <laughs> want to jump in? Say, Joe, Joe has been, you know, the go-to source for advice about how to find somebody if they can't do it themselves. So, and Joe often helps, of course. But you know, who who can do a good job painting these places, and and who has uh, the the kind of materials that you need to replicate the uh, the wood siding that uh, is historic and the in the houses. And then, you know, it's a matter of dogging people too, you know, um, thanks to you guys on city staff, you know, we have real good workable um, uh, design guidelines, architectural conservation district standards that are very specific. And while, you know, there's always some room for interpretation, the reality is we have a base of, of in, in, in ordinance that uh, we can point to that not only gives people a guide on how to to manage renovation of their houses, but establishes a floor below which you know, we just won't allow people to go. You know, you want to put in cheap windows. No, I'm sorry, you just can't do that. You've got to save the ones that are there or uh, replace with like uh, design. I just want to make add one other uh, reference uh, that I neglected earlier. You know, when, <clears throat> when I moved into the neighborhood like Joe, I got to know a lot of the uh, um, retired and working uh, people 
uh, who had history in the mill community. And you know, there's a tremendous sense of pride amongst folks who grew up in the mill village. I, I worked as a frame carpenter at Fort Jackson in his law school summers. And um, I rode with a plastering crew one day. They dropped me off at my house on Paul Wall Street. And the guy said, uh, I was born in that house. Can I come in and take a look? And he, he walked me around the house and showed me where, you know, he'd poked a hole in the, in the plaster wall and stuck a $5 bill to hide from his mother. And on the front uh, um, brick piers on the porch, he'd written his name. And I'd, I'd seen that years before when I was renovating. And instead of trying to remove it, I, I left his name, J, J-A-Y, on the, on the brick. And lo and behold, years later, he came and claimed it. So folks had a tremendous sense of pride about having come up in the mill community. And a lot of the work that went into keeping bad things from happening in the neighborhood, I really want to credit um, of the late uh, Jim Jaco and Larry Gates. So Larry uh, was a supervisor in the mill and uh, he's since passed away, but he was president of the Wayne Street Neighborhood Association, former a retired police officer with the city, tough, tough guy, wasn't going to let people get away with anything in terms of threatening his neighborhood. And Jim's uh, family of Jaco's uh, were associated with Jaco's corner of a tavern uh, uh, across from the fairgrounds and you know, long extended family. And so the loyalty to the mill community has meant a lot in terms of the willingness of folks to protect the neighborhood, even for folks who've long since moved away. And uh, you know, that's a real feature that we've been able to depend on in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Um, and Cotton Town, you know, we've we've tried a lot of different vehicles for um, educating our residents on on what it means to live in a, a designated historic district and what the expectations and requirements are. Um, I'm not sure we've hit on exactly the best way to do that yet, but we keep we keep at it. Um, uh, we have a, you know, a good, a good newsletter that comes out three or four times a year, and we always try to make sure that there's something in that newsletter um, that references the, the, the history of the neighborhood and the importance of, of protecting it and the, the fact that, you know, there are requirements. Um, we use our social media um, a lot uh, to well, both in proactive and reactive ways. Um, um, there, there are, are several of us in the neighborhood who will, uh, if someone gets on Facebook and our community page and says, um, I need recommendations for um, someone who can, I don't know, name your project that may affect the front of your house or something. There's always uh, one of us usually who's willing to jump in the comment and say, be sure to check this out with the city before you start. You know, we're sort of the neighborhood nudge uh, to, to, to remind people that there's a responsibility there to just not get the hammer and start wailing away before you make sure that, you know, you, you're, you're, you're good to go. Um, but it's a constant effort and one that I don't think we can ever, um, you know, fall back on. Yeah, and, and Josh, we, uh, we just awarded the Mabel Payne Award to, to your neighborhood this year for, for sort of some of the efforts that y'all have been making for, for stewardship and getting the word out. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, definitely. I think our experience is probably similar to Rusty's in the sense that we have, we've tried many vehicles, we still do. I don't know if anything's perfect. It's a constant stay on top of it, you know, stay, kind of stay in front of the uh, front of the pack uh, mentality. You know, you can never slack on it because when you slack is when someone will, you know, start to nip at it. And um, in some ways there's maybe like a carrot and a stick approach. Um, we do try to take the approach of sell the benefits of preservation. Um, especially with tax incentives, the Bailey Bill, uh, now that we're a national register district with the um, state preservation uh, tax incentives. Um, so trying to sell that benefit um, and then some of the non-financial benefits in some ways 
um, just like the sense of community and, 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 and stuff like that. Um, so try to sell them on that. But then when someone is not going to listen to it is, you know, doesn't care about going to DDRC, doesn't care about the guidelines for the neighborhood, you bring the stick. And um, we have a lot of vigilant neighbors and, you know, when we see something that doesn't conform, we're, we're not going to let it slide. Um, and some people hate that, but that's just, you know, you can't let things like that slide because kind of like give a mouse a cookie uh, attitude. And so when you see something, you see work going on, you, you email the city, hey, is this permit is, is this approved by preservation? Just checking on it and just being proactive that way I think helps. Um, probably one of the, the approaches we've really taken uh, as a late was definitely with social media. We had a complete social media restructure um, to make it more, just kind of modernize it a little bit um, to utilize. Uh, there was a switch in Facebook recently, make it more focused on groups and pages and kind of getting with that as well uh, was, was important for us so that there was a, a public page out there for people to see that. Um, also, we we hosted a website and we, we maintain that now. And it, I love the website. It's a great uh library of information both on preservation but also the history of the neighborhood and and just other little tidbits you know news stories here and there about the neighborhood um and and it, and what's really great about the website is when you're doing a google search of the neighborhood it's going to pop up at the towards the top of um of the google search which is really important especially uh for i think going forward is people my age millennials gen zers they're going to be doing research online about the neighborhood before they come in, or at least you hope they will be. Um, then, and then the last thing we did was a rebrand. Um, so historic Melrose is not one neighborhood. It's a collection of three neighborhoods. We have Fairview, we have Melrose Heights, and we have Oaklawn. I moved from Fairview to Oaklawn. I never truly lived in Melrose Heights, um, but it was understanding that that nuance wasn't uh, brandable. It wasn't ever going to catch on. And so we had to come up with the one name and the, the most common recognized name was Melrose. Okay. Now make sure that you throw historic in front of it. So that's clear that this is a historic neighborhood. And then with that uh, rebranding, we made sure that all the neighborhood, most of them, there's still some neighborhood signage that needs updated, but at all the entry points, there's neighborhood signage saying historic Melrose. It's very clear that this is a historic neighborhood. So just kind of different methods. Um, maybe it's a shotgun blast, but you, you, tr you try as much as you can and you see what works and you see what doesn't and you adjust going forward. Yeah. Vigilance is, is not lacking in, in historic Melrose. I know that. I, I don't work in the other neighborhoods anymore, so I can't really say, but I, I know I know historic Melrose. Y'all are y'all are always on top of things. Um, so um, all of you are are obviously um, really interested in the preservation of your particular neighborhoods. Um, and y'all have seen changes come and go over time. Is there anything that you're recognizing maybe now, maybe in the past few years, that um, could possibly cause issues over <laughs> there you go, Joe. Thanks. Um, cause issues over time, um, or or maybe you know, kind of a newer, I don't want to say threat, but um, issue to your neighborhood that you are going to have to address. Yeah, I mean, let me just say that the the um, um, preservation couldn't be more um, effective uh, than it is right now in our neighborhood. Um, we're adding uh, infill historic um, compliance, uh, compliant saw box houses and, um, and supervisor houses in Granby. So uh, the, the missing teeth are being filled in with new structures that are fully compliant with uh, our neighborhood design standards with a lot of good support from you guys at the city staff. And that's just a tremendous uh, improvement. I, I lived in a house before I moved to rent the one I'm and buy the one I'm in now that was burned down years ago. And it's been replaced now by a, a fully authentic um, uh, salt box house. Um, and then as Joe mentioned, a number of the houses that were rentals that, are, that were really in terrible shape, um, you know, clabbers falling off, final siding uh, have been uh, authentically 
renovated by the, the mill developers who have, as Joe mentioned, turned them into back into single family residences. The really upscale interior and exterior that are fully compliant. Um, the drawback is that with that success, unfortunately, uh, our rate of single family home ownership has not kept up. And you know what makes money right now through that investment is student rentals. And, and so the university spread into the community has meant that our long-term desire for increasing home ownership has been uh, thwarted for the time being. Um, and then we contend with a lot of the behavioral issues that go along with uh, having a lot of young kids in these rental houses that just don't see the difference between three o'clock in the morning for uh, having a, sort of a shouting match in the front yard or loud music uh, or you know, a Saturday after versus a Saturday afternoon. So, you know, enforcing the city's rental ordinance in terms of uh, tenant behavior is a challenge for us. And, uh, but I think we're all in it for the long haul and we appreciate that, you know, the, the preservation of the physical uh, plant of the neighborhood is, you know, the prerequisite to its long-term uh, viability as a community. And, uh, you know, we'll contend as best we can with, uh, with the, uh, the new, the transient neighbors who uh, who come and go from the, from the university, as I did, my wife reminds me, you were a student once too, living in those houses. <laughs> um, what do you think, Joe, on that score? Uh, you know, I think the thing is that we were stuck, and the, and the, and some of the folks that had renovated their homes twenty years ago uh, weren't keeping up, and. Uh, and we, we, it was just this quagmire of, of things going on that, that weren't going anywhere. So when, the, when Megan called and said, uh, Josh Harding uh, with PMC was interested in wondering whether it was okay to turn a duplex into a single family residence, I went, oh God, you gotta come here and pinch me. I just couldn't believe it. Right, it, I mean, that what I try to do with all the folks I recruited to buy homes here is I I tried to get them to turn it permanently into a single family residence. Why? Because that's that's kind of the antithesis of the rental property model. You know, usually you take a single family residence and divide it up and then rent it out and get more money out of it. So uh, for us, it was like, wow, great. And uh because our problem was finding people who are hardy enough to undergo a reno, number one, uh, and undergo a reno in a challenged neighborhood, number two, and uh, that had a classist, classist stigma, right? And then, uh, and then, and then finally, you know, we're just having, just having this opportunity, you know, that a third of the lousy, I mean, the low end rental property and stuff that, you know, every 10 or 12 years gets sold again to another slumlord. And, 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 you know, it's, it's sickening when you see it. some of these, the house next to Bob's, I wouldn't even, I, well, the guy who was the assistant coroner here in, in Richland County, wanted to live here. He loved it here. And we were trying to find him a home. And I showed him that house. Uh, and it was just, it was so disgusting. Like I, I talked him out of it. I said, it's mold. And it was just uh, like four cycles of slum housing, you know, but constantly kludging, you know, and just, you know, making do another coat of paint. I mean, that's what our, I mean, it's so much of that. And that's like gone. I mean, they gutted it and, 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 and redid it. So it's a contributing home. So, you know, our feeling is, as we've known over the years, all of us here in Columbia know that student housing is kind of fickle. You know, what's popular now might not be popular later, particularly with these wonderful tax abatements the city's been giving these developers. <laughs> so, uh, so we're hoping that eventually some of that's going to fade and they have PMC supposedly has an exit strategy and they're 
they're feeling with their work, with this dedication towards renovating the neighborhood, they, they're thinking that, you know, in four to five years, these houses are going to be worth four or $500,000 and they can sell them to uh, property homeowners. Right, not no longer rental problems. That's their goal. That's their exit strategy. You, you can't ask for better than that. You know, we're, you know, we're we're kind of rolling the dice here, but at least these people have deep pockets, and they're committed to upgrading the overall quality of the neighborhood. So we're we're hoping for the best, and we're trying to figure out ways now of meeting with the university and the city in dealing with some of these behavior issues you know, that have some uh, teeth, some enforcement uh, value. Anyway. Rusty, are you seeing any, any issues or threats currently? Well, the, I, the, um, Cotton Town is surrounded by uh, commercial corridors on at least three sides and possibly soon to be four uh, from an announcement that was made earlier this week or, or last week. Um, and, and several of those corridors are really taking off right now. You've got uh, the Bull Street District, which is um, to our east. We've got the North Main Street Corridor, which is showing signs of ticking up on our west. Then there's Elmwood Avenue on our south. And, uh, and, and we just learned that the, the property that the state had purchased with the intent of putting that connector on it back in the 70s, the state is, is looking at offering that property up for development now, which will um, sort of seal us in on the north end of the neighborhood if that comes to, to fruition. So, you know, Bull Street is really starting to take off. North Main is really starting to take off. Um, so, so that's going to put pressure on the neighborhood. Um, the neighborhood leaders are all already and have been for a while uh, very engaged um, in trying to um, you know, work with those developers that are coming forward with proposals and uh, be proactive about anticipating issues. Um, so far, so good. But th those are the kinds of things that will potentially have a real impact on the neighborhood. Uh, traffic um, is a, a major concern, especially with um, traffic cutting through to get from one major commercial corridor to the other, and we anticipate that, you know, that will just increase. So, so there's a concern. Um, um, so, so I think those are are probably um, the the most current things that we've got that will be with us for a while as we learn to sort of anticipate and, and manage the impact of that that growth. And let me say that that the the commercial development near Cottontown, much of it has been very, very positive. Um, it's brought amenities to our neighborhood that have not existed until very recently. Um, the, the little commercial district that's developed along Sumter Street where um, into coffee and a CrossFit and we've got the Warmouth restaurant and we've got Curiosity Coffee and all of these really um, wonderful locally owned businesses that are um, really providing benefit for the residents of our neighborhood. And we appreciate that very much. Um, we're, but of course, we just want to um, watch and, and be um, aware of, of the potential impact of future commercial development. Right, yeah, good, good opportunity, but you have to stay vigilant for sure. Uh, Josh? Yeah, so I think Melrose is lucky because there's a, a fairly low renter population. Most of our neighborhood is single family uh, owned by, you know, owner occupied um, homes, which is really beneficial. Um, more of it, like kind of what Rusty was talking about, it's more, I guess, more of an opportunity than threat is the Millward corridor is starting to get some attention. Um, and, you know, I think 
not just our neighborhood, but all the neighborhoods along the Millward Corridor have a vested interest in its success. And we want to see it um, become successful because it's local. It doesn't, you know, spur on gentrification or anything like that that we do not want to have happen. Um, and so in some ways that could, that as it develops, it could introduce a threat. Um, but right now it's, it's seen as potential and as an opportunity. Um, and there's a lot of hope in, uh, in the corridor developing. I think right now, so probably some of our uh, biggest issues that we face right now is just as homes turn over, um, generally speaking, the homes are turning over to younger people, typically people in my generation. Um, and so uh, I think I mentioned this, uh, it, it's more like preventing fads from nipping at uh, preservation efforts and from neighborhood guidelines. Uh, I don't know if anyone here has done TikTok. Uh, me and my wife have gotten into TikTok this past year during the pandemic, but there's surprisingly a really strong preservation culture inside of TikTok. Um, and it gives, does give me hope that the generation coming up behind mine has a, a love and appreciation for uh, older homes and they understand the importance and significance of them. Um, but one of the things I saw just recently was painting brick and um, how that is a millennial fad and it's equivalent to a baby boomers fascination with throwing carpet over wood floors. Problem is, is painting brick is a lot less reversible uh, than taking up the carpet. And so, uh, you know, just kind of like managing the fads and, and talking to people and helping them understand that the whole point of preservation is to resist these fads so that this timeless aspect of the architecture in the neighborhood is there for future generations. And I think another uh, potential threat is just a uh, loss of skill uh, in taking care of older homes, especially around windows. In, my, in our original home, it was metal windows. And that is a very hard skill to find someone's willing to work on uh, metal windows. And the majority of the homes here are wood windows. Um, but I think a lot of, uh, issues people have with maintaining their homes is because it's not super easy to find someone. You have to put a little extra effort into finding that person that can actually come out and repair uh, that window. And so they stop looking and they just go to whatever person's on the top of the list selling a vinyl window. And, and, and so I think um, that's probably a threat for probably all uh, older neighborhoods is um, as those skill sets are lost uh, what well, we hope not lost, but as as people get older, if those skill sets aren't passed down to younger generations, you lose that ability to work on these older homes, um, and you start to introduce maybe more modern uh, techniques that are not in keeping with the neighborhood and maybe actually are detrimental to the house because they're not uh, done in those techniques that tend to hold up much more like, in a much more longer than uh, maybe a modern product or technique. So I think those are some of the threats we're seeing. Yeah, definitely. That's, that's definitely one for sure that's throughout the city. Um, so uh, we're running out of time a little bit. I have one more question. I know um, Joe and Bob talked a little bit about wanting to see some more single family in the neighborhood. Um, so is there any, any goals for preservation that you have for your neighborhood? Any um, goals for the future that you want to see happen? Um, and, and can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I just say one of the things that we're actively working on now and have been for 10 years is trying to build more connectivity in the, in the city that, uh, you know, we've got this amenity, Granby Park and the city uh, riverfront uh, that's been my backyard as long as I've been in the neighborhood. Um, and we've been promoting a Rocky Branch uh, Greenway uh, that's one of the greenways identified in the county's penny tax uh, um, project, um, underfunded, uh, unfortunately, and uh, way behind uh, schedule. But uh, we're very, very optimistic about it. Um, and just to point out that the historic Columbia uh, uh, Capital City ball field on Assembly Street um, is uh, under contract for redevelopment in a mixed use residential commercial uh, project that would be a, a destination for uh, that greenway that ultimately then could go up through um, 
um, the university to, to, to five points following the, uh, the course of Rocky Branch and taking people from the university in Central City down to the riverfront through the, the Capital City Mill District, through Granby, Olympia, uh, Whaley Street neighborhoods. And so connecting people to our neighborhood is, uh, and, uh, and connecting our neighborhood to the rest of the city is one of our um, um, long-term goals that we're working on. The other thing that's also interesting is, I you know uh, Melrose and, uh, and Cottontown both have their uh, your art crawls. Well, what we're going to have and what we're working on now with uh, 701 CCA is uh, they received a grant from the Knight Foundation to create a Mill District art trail. And since our, our neighborhood is the more tangible, the more walkable of all the neighborhoods in the Mill District, uh, we're becoming more of a focal point for that with the riverfront and all. So soon we'll have a bunch of, I've, I've noticed also uh, people taking the five points uh, greenway, five points to the river greenway during COVID. I mean, we've had like 10 times the number of people who are walking through our neighborhood. So it's it's kind of getting there. And with the, with the added thing of new uh, pieces of sculpture and murals, uh, happening uh, monthly, quarterly. Uh, uh, we're hoping that's going to bring a lot of interest. People, you know, finding the neighborhood more interesting and a different vibe. So that's what we're working towards, trying to attract younger folks who are more interested in the more artsy, fartsy experience in, uh, in a historic neighborhood, you know? <laughs> oh, that's neat. Rusty? Um, and, and, Cotton Town, um, um, I, I, I think our, our, well, my personal goals for the neighborhood are to continue to make progress in, in uh, bringing the neighborhood together around the issue of historic preservation. Um, I think we've, we've done a lot of good work and um, think we will continue to, um, to do that. Uh, we too have been doing some branding work for the Cotton Town neighborhood and um, historic preservation um, is, is really, um, you know, part of our image and part of our branding and part of our identity as a neighborhood. So I think um, we'll continue to, to see that grow as we, you know, really what we want to do is, is promote the value of the quality of life that one can enjoy when you live in one of these neighborhoods. And, and historic preservation is one way of, of demonstrating that and, and promoting that. So I think we'll continue to, to use historic preservation uh, for the benefit of the neighborhood. And uh, the more we can demonstrate the value um, that that's providing to the neighborhood, I think that will give us more, um, more to work with when we're engaging um, members of city council or city staff, um, engaging in, in negotiations or, or conversations with potential developers about the, the importance of, of our neighborhood, um, uh, not just to the people that live here, but the importance of the neighborhood to the city and helping tell the, the story of Columbia um, and, and how it is, has become what it is today uh, because all of these neighborhoods played a role. Um, so that's, that's why I think historic preservation is, is important and, um, and, and, and so useful for, for all of us that are trying to establish a, a a good, strong quality of life in the neighborhoods where we live. Thanks, Josh. Um, I think there, you know, I, I really think for me as the neighborhood gets younger, maintaining what has been built here by previous generations is, is for me probably my number, I feel like my number one responsibility, um, you know, taking all that work that was done to make this a national register district um, and uh, making sure that as people come in, they, they want to be a part of that, right? That they, 
they're not coming in to, to change or reverse that, um, to reverse course. You know, they, they're here because they want to be here. They're here because they love historic neighborhoods. They love old homes and they want that sense of community that's, that comes from uh, those houses. So I think for me, it's, it's just preserving, not just preserving the neighborhood, but preserving the community that's been built here and, and what I fell in love with and what I fell on. Well, that's great. I know I've really enjoyed talking with, with all of you. I think this has been a really great conversation, uh, hearing all of your perspectives. Um, I think we do have a few uh, comments. If Megan, you want to you wanna jump in? We do. We have several comments, um, and I'll go through uh, all of them a little bit. Um, uh, we've got a couple from Patty. She said, a documentary on several historic neighborhoods could be a cool tool for preservation. Perhaps a project for you, Joe. <laughs> Um, and then she said, uh, Bob, you make a good point um, that the design of the homes and, uh, and the neighborhoods with porches, sidewalks, et cetera, support more social interaction. That seems to be something that everybody really echoed about their neighborhoods. Um, and uh, the John Bryan survey from 1993, the citywide architectural survey was an inspiration um, to her, Patty said. Uh, we were able to use the information uh, to help support uh, the Bellevue, aka Cotton Towns, um, application for National Register designation, um, which Rusty submitted in 1997. Um, and then she also noted, uh, it would be great to have a list of contractors uh, who are used to working on historic homes and a list of providers um, for special historic materials. Um, and we actually do have a list of contractors um, that we maintain that folks like you guys recommend to us when you have work done on your houses. So um, we're constantly looking to add to that list. Um, the more resources we can have for property owners, the better. Um, so if you know anyone, um, you know, feel free to email any of us. That's preservation at columbiasc.gov. Um, so if you if you know folks that can that can do specialized you know work or have experience working with historic homes, we always appreciate adding. Uh, or being able to add to that. So I think this has been a really great conversation. I think, you know, it's clear that there are commonalities between between all of the neighborhoods um, that these type of conversations can can really, you know, show and highlight um, how much you all have in, have in common. And personally, I find it very interesting to hear how everyone kind of came to their neighborhoods and uh, found preservation and has kind of really stuck to that and embrace that because everybody's experience is different. So I, I, I really enjoyed this. And I really thank you all for, for being a part of it. Um, and hopefully we can do this again. Um, and I hope everyone online enjoys this as much as I did. Thank you guys for sponsoring this. This is great. Thanks for all your hard work. You. City. Congratulations, Rusty um, and Josh for your work in your neighborhoods. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Great job, guys. Your neighborhoods are beautiful. We're getting there. Yes. Well, we, we have a lot of great historic districts in, in Columbia, so all have, have a lot to add to the city. So it's really important um, to have these conversations to highlight that. So, um, so well, if it, no one else has anything to add, feel free, but um, I think we'll, we'll sign off. And, and again, thank you all for, for joining and being a part of this. Um, and be sure to check out our other preservation month uh, events for the month yeah, of May. We've got lots planned. Um, we'll have another um, opportunity for, for some virtual interaction. Um, on May 20th, we've got a historic preservation trivia set up. Um, so uh, we'd love to have folks uh, join us uh, for that as well. Uh, that, that's my, my plug for this evening. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Guys, bye-bye. Good night. Bye. Bye.